The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending our Trial and Testimony Basics webinar. Um, I just wanted to let you know we will be getting started in just a couple of minutes. Um, I see that people are signing on, so I just want to give people a couple more minutes in case they're getting the program up and running. So hold tight, and we will get started shortly. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. So thank you all for attending our webinar on Trial and Testimony Basics. Um, this webinar is being put on by the Oregon Sexual Assault Task Force through our OVW Rural Grant. Um, and today presenting for us, we have Jody Barreto, one of our prosecutor instructors. So I will let her introduce herself and take it from here. Hi, as Nicole said, my name is Jody Barretta. I've been with the task force for about six years. I'm currently a, a senior assistant attorney general with the Oregon Department of Justice. I work mostly elder abuse, dealing with sexual assault in care facilities, hospitals by caretakers, and also abuse and neglect. Prior to that, I was with the Marion County District Attorney's Office for about 12 years, where I did almost solely sexual assault and child abuse cases. So what we're hoping to get out of today is kind of alleviate some of the fears that you may have about testifying, give you some pointers to how best to testify, some kind of pitfalls to avoid. And I know there's only a couple people listening in real time, but if you have any questions at any time, please feel free to post them and we'll get right to them. I want to make sure that you come out of here feeling at least a little bit more comfortable and that all your questions are answered. And Nicole will probably chime in as well. We've presented this quite a few times together and we'll try to anticipate some of the questions that normally come up when we have a room full of people. So we can go ahead and get started. So at this point, you all have been SANES for at least some period of time. Normally we get kind of a range of experience for this more advanced 
class, I guess, on prosecution and testimony. And I always ask people for kind of the good, bad, or ugly experiences that they've had. For you folks and for the purpose of the webinar, I think I'll just put your mind at ease and tell you what my experience has been with the last couple of these that we've done, is that really these cases aren't going to trial that much anymore. I have to contribute that in large part to just the great work of both law enforcement becoming more experienced in these crimes and frankly the great work of SANES across the state who are doing such a good job documenting and charting and you know leading defendants to start pleading guilty to these cases as opposed to putting a victim through trial. The few SANES that I know in the state who have gone to trial I can honestly tell you I have not heard of any bad or ugly experiences. People don't love testifying. Nobody loves testifying, believe it or not, unless you're one of the defense experts who gets paid, you know, five hundred thousand dollars to go testify. Everybody else is nervous about it. Nobody enjoys it. And so although we have scenes walking into courtrooms being kind of nervous about it, everything seems to be going fine, which is the good news. And I can definitely support what Jody says there. Um, I've been a scene at this point for about three years, and I've only actually testified once, and that was a grand jury testimony. Um, and the other times that I've uh, been subpoenaed, they've actually, I haven't had to show up because the defendant has pled out. And on at least one of those occasions, I was told that um, my chart and my findings, along with a whole bunch of other evidence, had been a the, the reason that um, the plea deal was reached. So uh, Jody is definitely um, in line with my experience, at least here. That's fantastic to hear. And, you know, I'll take this opportunity to just mention one change that's kind of coming to the state. Up until this point, you may remember from your original kind of 40-hour saying class when you heard from a prosecutor about grand jury and how that's a pretty casual appearance. You know, it's confidential. It's not recorded in any way. There's no bad guy there, there's no judge, there's no defense attorney, and it's not much preparation has gone into a lot of those grand jury, I guess, sessions up until this point. The law is changing on that, and in currently three counties in the state, they're now recording all grand juries, so it's being audio recorded, and by, I think, 18 to 24 months, all the counties in the state will be required to record those grand juries. So in the future, if you are getting a subpoena to a grand jury, it'll just be a little bit more formal than your experience might have been in the past. Nothing should change about your testimony. Your prosecutor will just likely reach out to you a little bit earlier and kind of prepare you for the fact that there is going to be a microphone in there, which can be a little bit disconcerting to everybody, but just a change I wanted everyone to be made aware of. So the next question I always ask people when they're in person is who believes that they are an expert? And no matter how many people are in the room, maybe one person raises their hand. Generally, nobody raises their hand. But the harsh reality of this is that when you are called as a witness in one of these cases, you are the expert, like it or not. So there are two kinds of witnesses in criminal cases. One is a factual witness, and that's Anybody who saw something, heard something, um, sensed something, anybody who, who was there when the crime happened, right there before the crime happened or after the crime happened, who no matter what their credentials or background, they factually saw and observed and have something to say about it. The other type of witness is an expert witness, and that's somebody with specialized training and experience in whatever they happen to to have that training and experience in. So a mechanic is actually an expert in mechanics. Um, you know, a, a someone who's taught elementary school kids for 10 years is an expert in teaching elementary school kids. And you folks are an expert in nursing. And you, if you're called as a witness in your capacity as a SANE, you will be considered an expert in that type of nursing. So you undoubtedly know more than anyone in the room about your job, and you will receive that proper deference. Because I can tell you the the rest of the people in the courtroom can hardly even pronounce the words that you're charting. So we kind of look to you as just the one to explain everything nursing to us and then everything factually relevant to the case. So the two cases I always want to make Saints aware of are State v. Crawford, and that is the case that allows a SANE or really any other medical professional to testify in essence for the victim. So you can testify in court as to everything that victim told you about the sexual assault or the perpetrator. And that's really, really important because in a lot of these cases, we have victims who don't want to cooperate come trial time, whether that's because they're scared or they're back in a relationship with the person or they just don't want the pressure and stress. And in those cases, they can come and they can 
I guess, retract who they said before and they can deny it happened. And you're allowed to get up there and tell the jury what they told you during their exam, which is really, really huge for kind of victims advocacy in the state. And it's a great way for us to still explain to the jury that this is what was said close in time. And then we can explain away the reasons for the recent denials. So that's a really big one. I'm sure you've all heard us say um, in order to allow you to testify as to what those victims are telling you in the exams, law enforcement cannot be in the room. And that's a fairly recent change, I'd say, within the last 10 years. The other case I always want SANES to be aware of is State v. Southard. And prior to this case, which is about eight years ago, we constantly had SANES coming in or other medical professionals who were able to talk about what the victim told them, talk about an exam, whether that exam showed injuries or not, and then give their diagnosis of a sexual assault or sexual abuse. C.B. Southard says that a diagnosis cannot be testified to without physical evidence. So I just bring that up so that you know if there's not a finding of a rip or a tear or a bruise or some other physical evidence that a diagnosis is being tied to, you won't be asked for your diagnosis. So, you know, don't volunteer it. If the, if the prosecutor needs it or wants it from you, they'll make sure to get it out of you. But just don't kind of bring it up in the normal course. So direct exam is pretty much always the same for a SANE or any other expert witness. And direct exam just means you're testifying, you're being asked questions by the person who gave you the subpoena. It is true that defense attorneys can certainly subpoena you as well. It happens pretty infrequently. When it does happen, you may receive a subpoena from the defense, but it's very rare that they actually call you to testify. And I'll talk about that a little bit later about how you can navigate those waters if you do get a subpoena from the defense. So most often you will be called as a witness, subpoenaed as a witness by the prosecution. So that means when the prosecutor asks you questions, it's called direct exam. Direct exam is kind of the explanation process. That's where we really get to show you off and you get to describe all of your training and experience and education and everything that qualifies you to be an expert. And then we go into your detailed explanation of the exam that you had done or your observations of the victim or the victim statements. So you can really plan for direct exam because the questions will always be in the same kind of order and they'll always be the same routine questions. You're always going to be asked about your education, training, occupation. For that purpose, I encourage you to create a CV of types or some sort of resume that you constantly update. The reason why I advocate for that is because there's nothing worse than talking about yourself. We all absolutely hate it. Um, we feel very self-conscious and we tend to make it very short and minimize it. Your prosecutor wants to show you off, even if you don't want to show off. So what your prosecutor wants is a detailed experience, all the education you've had, any specialty training you've had. Um, literally, it has on the slide awards. If you have won like a life savings award on your spring break five years ago, I want to know about it. So I want to be able to ask you about it. You know, sometimes we have police officers of the year. We have, uh, you know, ex-military folks who received awards for that. And we want the jury to hear all about that. If you write it down and keep a running list that you provide to your prosecutor, kind of takes the embarrassment out of it. Because then you can either just read straight from that list and you're welcome to take that up with you, or you can just provide it to your prosecutor and we can get it out of you. You know, we can ask you not just explain to us your, your training experience, but we can ask you question by question. Like, did you also attend, you know, Western Oregon University? And did you ever attend a 40 hour SANE class and things like that? So one way or the other, keep a running tally. It will really help us help the case and it will save you from having to recall all that on the stand. And we're always going to want to hear about it. I really want to encourage you to, to take note of that. In at least one of the cases where I didn't end up having to testify because the defendant pled out, um, we we actually went all the way to the night before the trial was scheduled and the defense attorney um, had actually mentioned to the prosecutor that she didn't know how she was going to argue this case, but the guy was very intent on going to court. He did not want to uh, plead out. And so one of the things that the prosecutor ended up asking from me was for me to send her all of my background and experience, which I was going to send her anyway. Um, but she mentioned, you know, we have this exam, you have a surprising you know, number of findings, like this is a very strong case that combined with the other evidence. And she said, I just really want to show how expert you are in this field and why this exam should be taken so seriously. And so 
back when I was doing my 40 hour training and Jody was telling me to, to keep a list of this, um, I started a list on my computer and I just kind of prettied it up a little bit and I sent it over to the prosecutor and she said, this is great and forwarded it um, along with, you know, a reminder about those exam findings. And very shortly after the, the guy pled out, I don't want to take total credit for that, but it definitely helped to show, you know, this, this is everything that you're up against and change the mind of um, a very stubborn person. Right. I'm really glad you had that experience because I think that's absolutely true. Your guys' CV and your resume is really intimidating, even if you don't believe it. And so, yeah, the earlier we can have it, it really can make a difference between maybe somebody rolling over and deciding to accept some responsibility. The other thing I encourage you to do, as well as keeping a list, is to rehearse it. You know, it feels silly, but we are all so much better if we practice how we're going to say something. And, you know, even attorneys are nervous about speaking in public to some degree, which is why we practice everything. You know, our preparation isn't just reading documents. It's saying things in the mirror. It's giving your opening statement in the shower. I used to commute from Portland to Salem for about 10 years, and I was the crazy person on the highway, always talking to myself on the morning going to trial. And I would do my direct exam, I would do my cross exam, I'd do my opening, and I promise you it makes you a better um, just speaker. And so it really helpful, helpful. I encourage you to do that. And so that's why I'm giving you kind of these basic questions that you'll always be asked so you can practice explaining your background and experience. And then there's some things that you're going to want to maybe practice explaining to a jury. Uh, a lot of the things that you guys work with every day, even, you know, what is a same? That's something that you'll always be asked and you're going to want kind of an, a rehearsed, simple way to explain that to a jury so, so they will understand. If you have friends who are good uh, sports, they can really be useful here. Those of you who have done 40-hour trainings with me or mock exams with me um, have probably heard me say, uh, when there's something that you need to explain to the patient, if you have a friend or family member who will roll with it, try explaining it to them first. Um, pick a friend that you don't know through your nursing job um, and see if they understand what you're saying. Uh, because getting into that layperson talk uh, can be really tough for us, um, especially when we're in a situation where we do want to show that we have experience, that we are experts in this. Um, we need to balance that with the fact that we also need to explain things in a way that an everyday person can understand, someone with out that background. So friends and family can actually get a huge kick out of this <laughs> if you choose them if you choose them well. <laughs> and that's a great point because in Oregon jurors are not allowed to ask questions. Um, and there are some exceptions to that but I have not heard of a judge allowing the jurors to ask questions so we don't know when they're going to have questions so we really want to put everything down to the lowest common denominator uh, with any matter that we're discussing that they might not be familiar with. So these are some additional things that you will always be asked if you're called to testify as a SANE. Again, the what is a SANE, you're going to want your blurb to be rehearsed and kind of used to, to talking about that. We will always ask you generally what the procedure is for an exam. And that's whether for some reason you didn't follow the general procedure in this particular case or not. We'll always just ask you for an overview. Uh, mostly to show the jury that like this is a thing. This is a real process that people are trained on. You're not just making it up as you go along. And then you'll be asked for a description of the actual procedure in the victim in the case that's on trial or that's before the grand jury. So it will start with your initial impressions. You know, did the victim give a reason why she was coming in? Uh, if you noted in your chart that the victim was especially upset or tearful, uh, you know, anything that you wrote in terms of initial impressions, we'll, we'll ask you about. We really want to paint this picture for the jurors. We will always ask you what the victim said which is why going back to your charting and your documentation is so important to have the quotations and as much detail as you can have, all in a way that signals you that, yes, this was their actual words. Uh, you know, sometime later that you're able to recall, I would only put them in quotations if they were actually what the victim said. Really helpful. You'll always be asked about the victim's demeanor, and that's not always, that doesn't always sound great. Sometimes with the demeanor we get is, laughing or joking or shy or you know any of the above and none of that's bad for us we just want to get out in front of it so whatever the victim's demeanor is we will likely ask you about it and you can't say anything wrong here it's just a candid recollection of what you observed or what you charted we will ask you in painstaking detail about the physical exam um, 
Quite simply, the reason why is because in the vast majority of sexual assault cases, the defense is, this was consensual and the victim's mad. This is revenge, or she didn't want her boyfriend to find out, or whatever the, the reason is that the victim may have made this up. Most often, the defendant's going to say, this was consensual and she's just trying to get me in trouble. Our best argument in, I guess, defeating that defense is when we get to stand up in front of the jury and in closing argument and say, you heard in horrific detail about the physical exam that this victim had to go through. We will have had you explain what a speculum is. And sometimes we may have you even bring one in and talk about just how long it takes, how it may be cold in the room, how it's uncomfortable, how these are strangers this victim is talking to. And we can argue no one in their right mind would put themselves through this type of physical exam if this didn't happen. So we really hit home always with that, whether there are findings or not, just kind of the humi humiliation of the exam itself and how uncomfortable that is. And we'll talk to you about evidence collection. If there is evidence found, you know, if evidence is not found or if DNA doesn't become an issue in the case, then we won't really go into that. We may just say, you know, did you do some, some gathering of hair? Did you do uh, a swab for DNA, but we won't go into a lot of detail about that. And then we'll always ask you for your conclusions or opinions. And that comes in normally one of two forms. Normally there is injury or there is not. If there is injury, the question will be something along the lines of, you know, in your opinion, was that injury consistent with what the victim told you happened? If there is no injury, the question will be along the lines of, is the lack of injury inconsistent with some sort of sexual assault? Um, and those are generally the two opinions that you're going to be giving, whether something's consistent or inconsistent. It is not admissible in court what your opinion is, whether you think it happened will never be admissible, and whether or not you believed the victim will never be admissible. So you, you should never be asked those questions. If it pops into your mind that that's the appropriate answer for a question, don't do it. Never give your opinion on whether it happened or whether you believe somebody. That is kind of instant mistrial, which means everything starts from scratch. So we want to avoid that. And your prosecutor will certainly talk to you about that and help you avoid it just by the questions they ask you. I want to touch back on the demeanor thing real quick. Um, as Jody mentioned, you may be asked these things, you know, a year or more after, um, after your exam actually took place, which is one of the reasons that we really stress in our trainings to make your descriptions of the, the patient's demeanor as objective as possible. Um, and this kind of is like when you're uh, putting down their quotes versus you know paraphrasing. If you put down exactly what you observe um, without putting your own subjective interpretation on it, that's so much better for when you're looking back at this a year or two or three years later, um, trying to remember exactly what that patient looked like. If you say that you know the, the that the patient was anxious, people show anxiety in so many different ways. If you say that the patient was upset or sad, um, those also get displayed in so many different ways. And when you're going back to these after having done, you know, perhaps dozens of exams between, you know, this one and the time that you're testifying, it can be really hard to recapture, okay, what made me think that they were anxious or sad or upset or happy? Um, and also keep in mind here just neurobiology of trauma and just the 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 number of different ways that people respond to trauma, um, all of which are normal. Um, for me, I know when I have something very stressful happen in my life, my first response is like this kind of manic laughter. And it's very much just this coping mechanism. I look a little crazy. And if someone just wrote down like, oh, she's happy because she's laughing, well, that's not accurate. But if they put down, you know, that I was laughing and maybe I was looking all around the room or something, that's a lot easier to go back and fit that into context of how that fits into a trauma response. Um, and then, you know, it, it takes away that interpretation, which can be really just erroneous. So cross-exam. This is what everyone's always worried about. Hopefully I can put your mind at ease a little bit. So cross-exam just means that the person who did not call you as a witness gets to ask you questions. And there are some different rules for cross-examination. You might remember from your 40-hour SANE class that direct exam is just by its nature nicer. It's more of a you know explanation. You're being asked these open-ended questions and you're being allowed to answer them and it's kind of the sweet spot. Cross-examination can be the opposite of that. 
So cross-examination is designed for leading questions, which means shorter questions implying the answer. And it normally calls for a very short answer. Um, a lot of times it's just a yes or a no answer. So in other words, it can be incredibly frustrating. So this is the area where most witnesses can um, not do their best. You know, it hopefully doesn't harm the case, but there are a few simple rules and goals, especially for expert witnesses, to keep in mind. Your number one goal throughout the entire trial, but particularly under cross-exam when it can be so frustrating to be asked such yes or no questions, is that you have to come across as unbiased. You do not have a dog in this fight. In your heart, you may absolutely believe that what the victim told you and you know what her experience was, that it was the truth, but you have to come across as the witness that you are. You're just simply being called in because you saw or heard something or because you have expertise in the matter and you will give the same answers no matter who is asking you. So that's kind of the number one goal. I always recommend that you listen closely to the question and if it doesn't make sense, then ask for clarification. You know, lawyers don't ask very clear questions. We're all guilty of it, especially kind of in the heat of trial. The question can be convoluted. We could be using certainly the wrong medical term. Um, sometimes things just don't come out right. So listen closely, and if it's really you don't understand what they're asking for, certainly ask in your most calm, cool, and collected just for clarification. You don't want to answer until you're ready to answer truthfully and accurately. Sometimes witnesses try to anticipate what you know where the, the lawyer is going. You don't want to do that. You want to just sit back, take it at your own pace, and if you need a second to think about it, you control the pace of cross-examination completely. So if you need a moment, take a sip of water. Uh, you can look at your chart. Just take your time to make sure that you are going to be accurate and, and entirely truthful. So the idea in, with some cross-examinations is to getting you kind of in a rhythm of going quickly. You want to slow that down and know that we all wait for you. And then the other key is to be prepared. Now, a lot of this falls on the prosecutor because ultimately it's their case. You're just, you know, they're just facilitating you getting the information to the to the jury. So the honor is on them for that. And a DA, by the time you make it to trial, I can't tell you it's going to be a week or two weeks before trial, but certainly by the time you walk in that courtroom, they should be able to anticipate the cross-examination subjects that you're going to be asked. There has never been a trial that I've had that I haven't known what the defense is going to be, and I can put my defense attorney hat on and think about where, if I were them, I would go, and I can give you some subject areas of, of what they're going to touch on. And once your DA tells you those, I think it's a lot more relaxing, because then you can practice what your answer is going to be, and you can, I guess, it, it narrows the scope of, of what you're anticipating, which might reduce the anxiety a little bit. And again, practice your explanations for the lay jury, because they won't be able to ask you the questions themselves. And Jody, can you expand a little bit on um, good ways to ask for clarification? And the reason I ask, I bet you know, <laughs> is because Jody and I did a, um, a, a mock testimony demonstration for one of our 40-hour trainings, and she was role-playing um, a defense attorney who was asking me a bunch of things that were meant to get me riled up. And I didn't feel riled up, uh, but at one point I said, Oh, I didn't hear a question in there. Um, and the way that came out, um, one, one of our trainees actually like whooped in the back because it just sounded so satisfying, which was completely counterproductive. I didn't think that I was being defensive. Like I didn't mean the defense, the question to be defense, to be defensive. Um, but it came across that way. So I was wondering if you could maybe give us examples of neutral language that sure. maybe we could just have in our pocket. Sure. Um, and, and we will be showing you some examples of good and bad expert testimony kind of at the end of our, our talk here, so you'll see some of this. And this is a very delicate balance. My advice is if, especially if the question is, like when I asked Nicole, it wasn't really a question. It's more like they're making a statement. I would just say, I'm sorry, could you just rephrase, rephrase that? And I think it's taking a deep breath, I would always start with, I'm sorry, like, you know, I'm sorry I didn't hear that correctly, or I'm sorry I didn't quite understand that, with kind of an apologetic error, I think, is the is the key. And Nicole's right, like, she wasn't, she wasn't acting defensive, but, because you're, 
you know, everybody's very emotional about what's going on. And so when it was heard, like, is that a question? It was like, ooh, burn. You know, she really got that in. And that's exactly what we don't want, no matter how you mean it to come across. So I would probably just start with, like, I'm sorry, could you clarify that? Or I'm sorry, I don't really understand. And, and put the honors on yourself to be like, hey, fine, it's my fault. I don't understand your silly question. But I will apologize and ask for you to rephrase. Sometimes the problem with the question is that it's like four questions in one. And a lot of times your, your prosecutor will object and say, you know, that's a compound question. But if they don't, and you're asked four questions at one, I think you can also back out of that and be like, well, let me start with the first part. I think what you, you know, the first thing you wanted to know is, you know, what her demeanor was, is, was when she walked in the room. Or, and you can separate that out. I think on cross, the key is to just to take deep breath and try to be as sickeningly polite as possible and act like if the, the question confused you that it's your fault because guarantee if it confused you it confused the jurors and you don't want to answer a question that you don't really know the answer to or if the question isn't clearly being put to you okay so now i'm getting into the nitty-gritty your exam will always have been years ago <laughs> these things do not happen quickly particularly with sexual assault cases you know everybody's always shocked when you get into the criminal justice system and they learn that a crime can happen and the trial can be two or three years later but that's very common you know there are certain guidelines in terms of how fast we have to bring somebody to trial in certain cases like when they're in jail but with sexual assault cases they can be so complex that often that's pushed out 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 and out also, a lot of times we have suspects that we don't know who they are. You know, we are now more routinely indicting people and putting out warrants for people's DNA samples. You know, on, we're calling them John Doe and we're merely listing the characteristics of their DNA so we can make sure that, you know, if we don't know who this person is, but they're caught 40 years later having committed something another type of crime and their DNA is swapped, which is routinely done now for every felony in the country, then we can still prosecute that case. And so you literally might have a case, knock on wood, I hope not, that happened 20, 30 years before you ever called to testify. The more realistic example is um, one can come back on appeal. So unfortunately, these cases don't always survive the appellate court and the law is constantly evolving. So in almost every sexual assault case, people go to prison for a long time and they're not happy about it, so they always will appeal. And there are a fair number of cases that end up coming back, which means something went wrong with the trial court and we have to do it again. So you're, you're not gonna remember these cases, I guess is my point, which can involve some degree of panic for witnesses who then get that subpoena. So what do we do? You've been subpoenaed, um, you try not to panic and follow these steps. So the first thing you want to do after receiving your subpoena, and you very well may not recognize the name, uh, prosecutors are getting better, but we're not perfect at getting the victim's name on the subpoena. Traditionally, subpoenas only have the defendant's name, which you're never going to know. You know you're never going to remember Joe Bob from four years ago. And certainly, neither is your records department when you try to get the medical records. So prosecutors are starting to get better at getting the victim's name on there so you know what in the heck case you're going to be testifying about. If they don't have the victim's name, they will for sure have your prosecutor's name or at least the prosecutor's office. So your first step is going to be figure out who the victim is that you're going to be testifying about and somehow get those medical records to review. And you want to do that first off, even if your subpoena is for six months down the road. I've had some sayings that have problems in the past. I don't know if it's still going on, but with Definitely. getting medical records, it's going on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Getting me medical records from the actual facility. And uh, that is a problem. What I can tell you is that if the prosecutor has subpoenaed you, they know who you are, which means your prosecutor has the medical records. So if you can't get them, or even if it's just easier to get them through the prosecutor, call up your prosecutor, email them, and say, I need the records so I can review you know, immediately. HIPAA does not apply to prosecutor's offices. So while we you know, have an ethical obligation to keep some things confidential and not for public viewing, we will have those medical records and we will absolutely share them with you at the earliest point you need to review them, which is going to be right after you receive that subpoena. So the next thing you want to do, and I guess with your first glance over at the medical records, is look for any areas of concern. Now, doing this is going to alleviate a lot of your worry about testifying, and at least hopefully it will. Most of the times you won't notice any problems, but sometimes there will be a change in policy or practice, 
um, something that you did, you know, 10 years ago is not the way your facility operates anymore. Sometimes this comes up with even these, I'll call them Crawford interviews, but you know, it used to be the case law enforcement and SANES would interview a victim at the same time. That now has changed. So you want to be aware of what was then and what was now so you can explain that to your prosecutor. Sometimes you'll catch an error in charting, incomplete charting, or um, luckily this doesn't happen very much, but it will occur to you that the information that's in your chart is no longer medically sound. So these are all things that your prosecutor will not catch. And we really count on you on that initial review to catch them, and then I'll tell you how to deal with them. So the important thing is don't panic or freak out because this happens in every profession. I cannot tell you the number of police reports I've read where it has like the victim's name, you know, mixed up with the suspect's name or even the victim from the case before. So this stuff happens. The thing is we just need it pointed out to us so we can deal with it, and then it's really not a big deal at all. So let's start with policies or practices that have changed. Again, first rule is tell your prosecutor. I think some people get hesitant to do this because they feel, um, I don't know, they don't want to bug the prosecutor or they think the prosecutor already knows that this is a practice that's no longer followed. Rest assured, we don't know anything about, <laughs> about how other agencies work at all. So. Um, and, you know, we're constantly getting new prosecutors who have only dealt with these cases in the last four or five years and would never know that there was another process that was followed years before. So if you see something that you notice, we no longer do things this way, tell your prosecutor immediately. The issues that where this comes up, um, not routinely, but when it does come up, it generally has to do with DNA stuff. So currently, as I'm sure you all remember, the DNA crime lab will test for aggressive handling. So they will take swabs of you know, around the wrist um, in sexual assault cases or around the neck. Any, anything that's been aggressively handled that they might be able to pull some DNA off of. We see this in you know, car theft cases where they're pulling DNA off steering wheel or, or shift gear shifts. So this is a relatively new thing. Back, I'd say, as recently as about eight years ago, the crime lab would not test anything that didn't wasn't a murder case or uh, a rape case where there actually was DNA found. And so a lot has changed since then. Where this comes up is where you had a case that was prior to aggressive handling testing. Now you're going to trial, and this is a case that had it happened yesterday, you would have been sending it to the crime lab for aggressive testing. What the defense attorney is going to want to argue is that, look, no DNA was tested. This was an incomplete examination, shouldn't be trusted, you know, the OJ defense, the investigation was flawed. So what we're going to want to do in that case, you're going to want to tell me, you know, I didn't send this back to the lab back then because that wasn't the policy of the lab. And then I can call a crime lab tech to explain that and to explain how, you know, back 10 years ago, they didn't have the personnel or the equipment to do this aggressive handling and it wasn't sophisticated enough. You know, now they have robots that test hundreds of DNA samples at a time. So just the technology has changed, the staffing and resources has changed. So we can call somebody to explain all that away. We just need to know about it. So the other example I can think of, issues that come up where just policies or practices that have changed are the prior to, to 2007, the same had to report to law enforcement. So the issue that the defense attorney is going to try to make out of this is, you know, why you didn't report after 2007. It's a total smokescreen. It's a red herring. What they want the jury to think is, hmm, if the same believed the victim, they probably would have reported, i.e. this victim's lying. So we can deal with all of that. Just let us know. Uh, you know, even some of the older prosecutors, you know, we don't remember that change. So if it's, hey, I didn't report this, but remember, we didn't have to. She didn't want to report it at the time, and we'll get out in front of it. So then the, the third issue is the swabbing for digital penetration. Again, we did not used to do that, and exams may show up and be set for trial where there was no DNA tested because the allegation was digital penetration. Again, let us know that that is why no, no swabs were taken or why it wasn't sent to the crime lab, and we will have a crime lab technician come up and explain that to the jury, and then it's no big deal. So policies or procedures that have changed, um, make sure that you, when you alert your DA to the fact that something has changed, if you're not completely comfortable explaining it to the jury, just tell your DA and we'll get somebody else. That's not an issue at all, especially if it came to, um, you know, the Crawford stuff. So like, here's why I did my interview 
without a police officer when a police officer used to be present. And if you're not comfortable explaining kind of the legality of that or that you got advice from legal counsel to tell you not to do that, just let the DA know and we will bring in somebody who is qualified and comfortable doing that. There's nothing worse than you being asked questions that you are either not equipped to answer because it's not really in your wheelhouse or that you're uncomfortable. So just let us know. And bottom line with these examples that I've given are DNA matches can't be explained away by changing policy or procedure. So in the end of the day, these defense arguments are not going to hold any water. I mean, all of a sudden, if you, you know, if DNA matches the defendant, they're not getting out of it, no matter what policy or procedure had been followed. You know, DNA doesn't magically appear matching the person that the victim said perpetrated the crime. If the DA knows about it, it can be explained during direct examination, which is what we want. My goal in trial is to make sure there are no surprises and that I look like I'm not hiding anything from the jury. So I don't want the defense attorney to have any aha moments. I don't want any, you know, gloves not fitting and people acquitting. I purely want to get out in front of it and act like it's all fine. So I want to ask you all my questions where you can answer them in a nice, friendly way and have all the latitude and time to explain your answer. And then it's no big deal. And then it looks like I'm not scared of anything and I'm not hiding anything. So whatever I know about, I can make it okay. And you want to practice explaining these changes in policies or procedures in a way that you're not flustered, apologetic, and that you're not defensive. It's just a change. So another moment of panic for SANES or other expert witnesses is when you notice that there's an error in the charting. So either the wrong name is being used, sometimes on a, a chart, you're actually putting the injury on the wrong part of the body, um, dates of birth can be transposed, things like that. Again, when you see it, when you review that chart, when you first get a subpoena, just tell your DA immediately. Get out in front of it. At that point, you can strategize and see if there are other sources that can corroborate the rest of the chart. So an example of maybe you documented an injury happening on the wrong side of the body, uh, there may very well be police photos or photos that a victim took herself or anything else that can corroborate that, no, you're not crazy. Um, it was just an error and that where, in fact, the injury occurred. And then you just explain it was an error. I caught it. I'd let the DA know immediately. It doesn't doesn't mean that there's anything else wrong with the with the chart. And you just want to relax because these things happen. Like I said, law enforcement constantly, I mean, they're writing so many reports that there's a lots and lots of errors that we just get out in front of and explain them on direct examination. And it really doesn't turn out to be a big deal at all. Incomplete charting, kind of same thing. People start panicking about this. And again, tell your DA, not only will it get them out in front of it, but it will make you feel better because they will inevitably tell you it's not that big of a deal. Uh, in that case, if it matters, we try to find missing information in other medical records. You know, if it's some piece of information that is really necessary to something that you're going to be testifying about, then we, we can try to find it elsewhere in other medical documentation, whether it's from subsequent visits or previous visits or just supplemental things. And your DA can help brainstorm about how to do that if, if they care. And then you and the DA together will kind of decide whether it matters to your overall examination or not. And if it does, then you just practice and think about a way to explain why it doesn't matter to your overall examination, why it's just an, an incomplete charting. So after our last training for this, Nicole actually got some questions from a saying who was panicking a little bit, I think, because she had gone back and looked at her first couple of exams and noticed some charting errors, some incomplete charting. I think she had forgotten to, I think, write her name across the evidence tape. Yes. Um, she'd also not documented the time she gave the kit to the police officer, mm -hmm. some things like that, that of course are within the protocol. But, you know, rightfully so, she was really nervous about it. And oh my gosh, did I really screw something up? She did the right thing, which is uh, reach out to Nicole with those questions. And Nicole contacted me and we are always here for those type of things, whether it's our case or not, whether we, we know the, the prosecutors, whatever, we can help fix these things. And in the end, none of it was a big deal. My advice to her was when she went back, I'm not sure why she was looking at those charts, um, but she was reviewing them for, for some reason. She hadn't gotten a subpoena yet, and she noticed these errors. And my advice to her and my advice to you folks is if that happens to you, document somewhere. Write it down 
on this date, I looked at this chart, here's what I noticed is missing, here's what I remember about it at the time, or, you know, something, especially if it's still fresh in your mind. And I think in her case, it was that she had recognized that she had written the time that she collected the evidence and not the time she'd given it. And she would just documented that and then put that somewhere where she would know to get it if it ever, if it ever came up, if she ever got a subpoena for that case. And that's perfect. That's really what we want to see. We don't want to wait till, you know, you review it, you notice there's some errors, but you just cross your fingers and hope you never get a subpoena. Don't do that. Put your mind at ease and, and write something down about what you noticed and what you remember, and that kind of fixes everything. Because then if you are called 10 years later and you have an incomplete chart, you can say, yes, but I noticed it six months after the fact, and I wrote it down, and I've refreshed my memory with those notes, and I can now testify about it. Can I ask you about something that has come up a few times that I've heard, yes. which is, you know, we do all of our chart, and I think it's like page 14 in our chart is where we sign over the chain of custody to the police officer. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it gets buried, and that gets missed. How would you handle that if you don't know who the officer is that you pass on the evidence to? And so the missing part is just who the officer is and what time you signed it over? Mm -hmm. Or sometimes even the time is on there, but like the signature wasn't, like you got it ready and something like that. Because I've heard of that from a few people. They just forget that, that signature. Right. Um, we want you to do it. It's really inconsequential at this point for especially this type of case. So this type of case, if we're getting evidence that's then that we end up using, that at the crime lab they're finding DNA, um, I mean, that's pretty solid. No amount of who touched this and when is going to plant that DNA there. It matters a little bit more in other types of cases where it's, you know, maybe some drugs are being tested or something like that. But the bottom line is when a police officer takes custody, they're charting that somewhere as well. And then on that evidence itself, when it's brought to the crime lab, it's put who the officer or who the crime lab received it from and who received it. So if chain of custody ever becomes an issue, it's really not the end of the world that you didn't chart it at all. Um, we want you to do it, but yeah, definitely not panic worthy. You know, in I'd say 90% of these cases, no DNA ever shows up. In the few times that it does, it's never the defense that somehow I was talking that you know, some officer and they got my DNA and planted it in this rape kit. So that's the, the kind of good news. Cool. That's what I've been telling people and I yeah. feel good about that. <laughs> and I don't think we have any questions yet, but let me check just to make sure. Nope. Okay. We'll keep going. So the big doozy, and uh, we treat this a little bit differently, the steps after a subpoena, if the information that's in the chart or the diagnosis or something about what you know about the case is no longer medically sound, that's like alarm bells should be going off. That you want to tell the DA immediately, um, and it may tank the whole case, depending on what it is. But the kind of bottom line with this is that the reason why I think being a prosecutor is the best legal job you can have is because our sole job is to do the right thing and to seek the truth. So we want to know if there's information that's no longer medically sound, if something has changed in the literature or something's changed in the practice, let us know and we will try to seek the truth of that. Sometimes that requires a dismissal of the charges. Sometimes it requires just a, a different plea offer to be made, or sometimes we can fix it by retesting something or, or dealing with it. But that's something that you really need, need to tell the DA immediately. This has come up for me in two murder cases, unfortunately, and uh, both of them required a disposition different from the one that I wanted, but the, the medical professionals kind of handled it two very different ways. In the first one, it was a baby who'd been found in a dumpster, and that had been about 20 years prior to when we, we found the mom. And the medical examiner at the time did a floating lung test. And that was the what was done at the time. And if the lungs floated, that means they had held air, i.e. baby was born alive, and this was a murder. So that was the case 20 years ago. Finally, the mom ends up getting arrested for a felony. They do a DNA swab, connect her to the baby. Boom, we've got the person who, who killed this child. So we were all ready to kind of early in the process, so we were grand jurying the case, met with this medical examiner to talk about what his testimony was going to be, and he tells us, oh yeah, it turns out that floating lung test, not medically sound anymore. We've, we've decided that now lungs can float without ever having breathed air, so I can't tell you that the baby was born alive. Changed everything. Um, that woman certainly did not get a, a murder charge, but he he told us right away. He went back and looked and determined it was not medically sound and the right thing could be done sooner rather than later. The second time that happened to me was again a, another 
death of a small child. This time the man had been tried once. It resulted in a mistrial. He was tried a second time. He was convicted of murdering that child and he went to prison for 10 years. And the Court of Appeals reversed that. And so the, the case comes back about 15 years after the fact. And the initial testimony at both the first trials had been that we know the time that this baby died because of the food that was in the stomach. And following eating that, the baby couldn't have eaten following the head injury that was sustained. So we know that it was in dad's custody. That was the, the time of the injury. So that was two trials. We end up literally the day before the third trial and we're talking to that medical examiner and he doesn't offer anything different. And it wasn't until we actually asked the x-ray tech and we had to ask and, and get back to the medical examiner of the fact that since the second time testifying in the trial, he had seen four or five babies who were able to eat food after suffering such a, such a catastrophic head injury. So that really changed things. Really wish that medical examiner had done the right thing and as soon as he saw that the information was no longer credible or medically sound would have let us know because it definitely drastically changed the way that we treated that case. So how do you have great expert testimony? Great expert testimony is kind of the combination between competence, which you all have. You all have the qualifications to be an expert. You are experts, like it or not. But it's that competence plus performance. So that's kind of the, the second part. We all know the information's in you, but how can you put it out to the jury in a way that makes you come across as the unbiased expert that you are, who's just there to educate and not kind of pull the bull over anyone's eyes? So there are some tools of the trade of how to have great expert testimony. You know when to stand your ground and when to concede. This is a, a big one. We see a lot of not just experts, um, but witnesses in general who think that they're harming the case when they concede a point to the other side or when they have to admit they don't know something. And this is really important to have some you know, thoughts going into doing this, that you only know what you know, and there's going to be a lot of things you don't know. And there are going to be a lot of points that you can concede to and be absolutely willing to do that. That's the key to coming off is really unbiased, which is the number one goal of testimony. You don't want to play word games. Um, you know, my whole goal in a trial is to have the jury like me. And I do that from the beginning to end. Like, from right when we start picking a jury, if a jury likes me, then they're going to listen to me. And in my opinion, they're more likely to do what I want them to do, which is convict. So um, I try to be as likable as possible, and I try to make my witnesses as likable as possible. And one of those things is to not play word games. You guys are going to know a lot more medical terms than we do. You're going to know a lot more about anatomy than we do. No doubt about it. The one time where I've, I've seen this come up from a sane, most times this comes up with defense experts and, and I'm not really concerned with them. I don't mind them looking bad. But with, <laughs> with you guys, I've only had it come up one time and it was about uh, the word vagina. And it was, you know, the defense attorney was asking a question um, and kept using the word vagina when what she meant was just generally a genital area. And the, uh, the nurse kept kind of arguing with her and like, nope, but that's not the vagina. And I didn't examine her vagina. And it just became this back and forth when, truth is, being the defense attorney we're using what the layperson calls a vagina, which is that general area, and not the actual clinical where the vagina is. And it just came off bad. It came off like arguing for the sake of arguing. And so I really hope that you stay away from doing that. Um, I think a good way to handle that, if you want to be precise and if you know, we're talking about the vagina being the external genitalia and you know that it's not, you can just clarify and be like, well, you know, actually clinically your vagina is up here, but I know that you're using, you know, the common usage of it and kind of explain it that way. Just be real aware of not arguing back and forth or, or trying to be kind of funny or cheeky. You want to try your hardest to be the same on direct examination as on cross-examination. I said that's tough because they are designed differently and questions are, are phrased differently. The way the courtroom works is that you're first asked questions by the, the party who calls you. So that's generally going to be the, the prosecutor. You answer my questions. And then the defense attorney gets you gets to ask you their questions, which are going to feel very stifling and like you're not able to explain everything the way you want to explain it. When they're done asking you questions, I get to ask you more. I get to clarify that. So that's a pretty big thing for you to remember, is that even if you feel like you've been cut off or that you have so much more that you want to say about a point, I get to save you and I get to go back and forth as many times as I want. So just try to be 
as personable on direct as on cross, keeping that in mind, I think, will help. And you never want to seem like a know-it-all. You know, there's, uh, we'll see an example in a little bit about somebody who kind of is a, is a know-it-all, but there's nothing, um, you know, there's nothing more frustrating than, it's like arguing with your kids. When you prove a point to them and they just want to say, yeah, but, and argue back with you. And it, it kind of turns you off to the jury. Another thing where I see witnesses get in trouble with this is that they want to come across like they are an expert kind of in everything in their field. And inevitably, you will be asked about some piece of literature or some study that you are not familiar with, or that you haven't heard of. Just admit that. Like there's no harm in saying, nope, I'm not familiar with that article, or that is not something that I've read, or I'm not familiar with those type of guidelines, and just concede to that, as opposed to trying to um, tackle a subject or something that you're not familiar with. Other hints for great expert testimony are to give examples. You know, we love this. We love for you to educate the jury. Um, in, in direct examination, when I'm asking you questions, I don't get to do any explaining myself. And so I have to get all these explanations in through you. So when I'm going to ask you to give examples, if you if I ask your de their demeanor and you, like uh, Nicole was saying, if you just give me, well, she was laughing, um, that's not going to be very helpful. But if it was, well, she was looking around the room and she had her hands up to her mouth and she was laughing, but it, the laugh is a little hysterical sounding or any sort of example that you can give. And another area where we like for you to give examples is when you're describing the procedure. You know, you can talk about all the different things that you've seen. So some victims wait for hours, some people have support, some people don't have support, some are angry, some are silly, some are making jokes, some sort of explanation using your training in this regard and your experience by that point that all victims are different. And so really when you're on direct, it's your show to just educate the jury as much as you can about uh, this area of your expertise. So when I keep telling you to always practice these things and kind of have in your back pocket how you want to explain things, you don't want to seem canned, and I'm confident that none of you will, but candid, just that you're up there to be uh, the truth teller no matter what is asked of you, and you don't have a dog in the fight. You're just there to help educate the jury. There are certain things that can certainly interfere with performance, and I put this up here not to scare you, but maybe have you anticipate experiencing these things so maybe you can plan for them and as I told you before nobody likes testifying you know I'm in a courtroom for a living and almost every day I'm dealing with a courtroom and I love going to trial and I've been a witness once in a criminal case and it was horrible I never would have anticipated that I would feel that way even when I got my subpoena I was a little bit anxious but by the time I was called as a witness and brought up to the witness stand and had to swear to tell the truth I was like red and sweaty and I felt very uncomfortable about it, even though it's a courtroom I've been in dozens of times before. And so these things are just going to happen. They're going to happen to everybody, and they happen to some of my favorite witnesses. There's something about um, appearing a little bit anxious or nervous that can can put off an air of credibility. So expect that that's going to happen to you, that there's going to be some degree of anxiety in whatever you, whatever mechanism you use kind of in your daily life to deal with anxiety provoking situations just plan for it and maybe get you know more sleep or um, meditate beforehand or whatever it is that you think is going to help you expect to be a little bit anxious it, it can be stressful for some people it can affect your sleep um, and sleep deprivation and hunger can certainly affect your performance if you're doing anything that just makes you not feel good it might substantially affect your performance a distraction from the current question, trying to anticipate where the defense attorney is going or what the prosecutor wants from you, and kind of thinking ahead um, will make you brush over the answer that you're giving. And so just try to really focus on the current question being asked and how you're explaining that. And then a fear that conceding anything shows weakness. Again, this fear that you're somehow going to affect the case and what you think happened and the injustice will happen, and you just have to let go of that because there's nothing that you can say that's going to affect the case at all. Um, it's just going to make you more believable if you can see what you don't know or if you can see that there are other possibilities. There are a lot of common mistakes that are kind of run the gamut through all witnesses, not just expert witnesses, but attacking the questionnaire and not the question. Some people's style on cross-examination is incredibly abrasive. There are some defense attorneys that make their money being jerks. 
in the courtroom. And it's their, it's their stick, and it works for them. It doesn't come come around very often. Uh, for the vast majority of defense attorneys, you know, you get more. Um, what is it? You get more bees with honey, and they'll be overly nice to you. But there are a few around the state that really want to get under your skin, and will really want to elicit this kind of attack on them so that you seem unbiased and you seem emotional about the case. So you always want to be careful to just attack the, the question. You want to answer the question and not take it personally and kind of bark back at the questionnaire or be flippant. It's always a mistake to be absolutist without picking battles. Uh, you never want to reverse positions. I have not seen a, a sane do that, but I've certainly seen other expert witnesses reverse positions and come out strongly with a, nope, I believe this was my diagnosis. And then after a few questions, well, it could also have been this diagnosis. That shall be hashed out before trial. Some witnesses, because they're anxious or nervous that they're going to do something to hurt the case, they try to stall and they... Um, Maybe they need more time to, to think about it, which is fine, but what's not fine is to ask the person to repeat the question, virtually every question, just to buy yourself that time. Instead, take a, take a sip of water, um, look down at your notes, take a deep breath. You can take the time, just if you're constantly asking for the question to be repeated, it comes across as a stall tactic, and then the jury wants to know why you're stalling, and they infer all sorts of strange things into that. I mentioned before, fighting over the meaning of words with common meaning, you don't want to be adversarial or argumentative with anybody. It's really not your role. Uh, making comments when there's no question, that happens a lot, mostly in cross-examination, because there's more you want to say. So if somebody asks you a question, uh, pretty typical for sexual assault questions by defense attorney is going to be like, well, this injury that you saw to the vaginal area, that could have been caused by consensual sex, correct? And your answer, of course, is going to be correct. And a lot of people want to say correct, but can I talk to you about other things that I know? Or you want to add something in? All that does is make you seem like, again, you have a dog in the fight. Like you are advocating for one side um, and that you are taking this personally or that you have a bias. So don't make any comments when there's no question. If the DA wants to follow up with you and give the opportunity to answer those questions, they, they certainly will. And you shouldn't ask questions of the cross-examiner. You know, sometimes that gets into a back and forth and that all things are downhill from there. When it's both the person asking the question and the person answering the question are kind of arguing back and forth or asking questions, never a good idea. So your, your role is purely to answer questions and clean it up on redirect examination, with the prosecutor, and not to ask questions. Other common mistakes are overreaching, so talking about something that is not in your wheelhouse, I guess that's about the same as opining on subjects outside your expertise. You know, a lot of times uh, we have cases where there's multiple experts or multiple issues, and it's always a mistake if you're up there to be an expert, you know, sane witness, and defense attorney, or even sometimes the prosecutor starts asking you about your knowledge of, you know, PTSD or alcohol and drug addiction, or something that is truly not in your subject of, of expertise for that trial. And it can be, sometimes you may have some experience in those things, but don't go too far down that, that path. You want to make sure that you're really credible with the things that you do know, and let them find another expert on the things that, that are not within your expertise. Being unavailable or resistant to witness preparation uh, is not good. As I told you before, it may not happen well in advance of trial, but it, it will be happening. At some point, your prosecutor will reach out to you. If you are particularly anxious about it and you want it sooner rather than later, you should be reaching out to your DA to say, like, hey, I really need some sort of, of preparation. A lot of times it happens over the phone. If you'd rather have an in-person meeting, just tell your prosecutor. They should be coming to you. But being unavailable or resistant is going to make you feel unprepared and, quite frankly, it's going to make you unprepared because you're not going to know what the, what the DA is going to ask you and you're not going to have that knowledge of what the defense is and what they're likely to ask you. Now, every now and then, you will be subpoenaed by the defense. Um, often times you will be subpoenaed by both the prosecutor and the defense and that doesn't mean that you have to testify twice all that means is so as a prosecutor and I put out subpoenas and, and call people as my witness because I'm the one who subpoenaed them I can tell them not to come at any time I can call them off so when a defense attorney also subpoenas all my witnesses it just means that I can't unilaterally call them off it would have to be the defense attorney calling them off as well. So it's just to make sure that you're going to be there. But your testimony would all be taken care of after you're called as a prosecutor. You wouldn't have to be 
call up there twice. Would that affect how direct and cross goes at all if you're subpoenaed on both sides? That's a really good question because it could, but it doesn't. So like in theory, according to the rules, you're exactly right. So I want to do, I, mean, I would much rather, um, I mean, cross-examination is better because it's really the lawyer testifying. <laughs> and so I could, technically, I could call you as a witness and do my direct testimony. Then the defense could call you as a witness and do all the cross. And then I might want to cross-examine you, so I might make them call you again on direct. Interesting. It, it, that can technically happen. I have never seen or heard of it happening. Um, if somebody was inclined to do that, a judge would say, come on, we're going to do this personal professional courtesy. Get out all those questions at once. It's technically a rule that you can only ask cross-examination questions as to the subjects discussed in direct. Mm -hmm. So it's technically a rule that you can keep it real small, and then the defense would be able to call you back on direct. But it's just there's just too many witnesses. It irritates the court. It, it doesn't happen as a general rule. Uh, one thing that can happen is that you might not get a subpoena from the prosecutor and you might only get one from the defense attorney. And that's where I think not just expert witnesses, but everyone kind of freaks out a little bit thinking, uh oh, what did I do in this case? All of a sudden I'm a defense witness. I don't want to help this person out. Why am I being called? Um, and don't panic. A lot of defense attorneys just do that as a matter of course and then don't end up calling you as a witness. Or quite frankly, sometimes if you are getting a subpoena from the defense attorney, it's probably because the victim's either demeanor wasn't as a lay person would expect it to be or there were no physical findings. So they want to put you up there to say you didn't find anything, right? Um, either which way, that's fine. You know, those are questions that you would answer on direct as well. You have a couple of options when you get a subpoena from the defense. If they're a good defense lawyer, they will give you a subpoena and then also say, I'd like to meet with you to go over your testimony, which is great. I recommend that you do that. You, It's within your rights to say, sure, I'm happy to talk with you on the phone or I'm happy to meet with you. You can say, nope, I don't really want to talk to you outside the courtroom. Or you can say, sure, I'll talk to you, but I'd like the, the prosecutor present. All those things are perfectly acceptable. I've seen all of them happen. Um, the Refusing to talk to them is probably not the best one because that makes you seem like you've formed an opinion and you have a side. But certainly I encourage you to invite the prosecutor to be there. There's no harm in doing that. It probably makes you feel more comfortable. I have seen some hospitals or some, I guess, hospital lawyers tell employees that they are not allowed to talk about the case prior to trial. And if that comes up, your prosecutor can help navigate that with your facilities legal counsel and you but you know don't panic if the defense subpoenas you it's going to be for one of those things there's no injury or the demeanor was not what they would have expected and that's it and we can help you deal with that um, and you're not doing any harm to the case at all in fact if you're ever called by a defense attorney you know prosecutor gets to ask you questions too so you can I can use you in the, in the same way that the defense attorney can, so don't panic. Does it bring your neutrality into question at all if when you're subpoenaed by defense, you ask for the prosecutor to be there, but when you're subpoenaed by the uh, prosecutor, you don't ask for a defense to be there? No, I've never seen that be an issue at all. Okay, cool. um, I, I can't even think of a time when I've seen defense counsel ask, like, you know, will you require the prosecutor to be there um, at all? And, and if you ever were, I would think that the appropriate answer would be like, well, this is somebody that I've, you know, worked with in this capacity or, you know. Yeah, it's, it's never been an issue. And I've never seen a witness ask for a defense counsel to be there, um, even really a defense witness. So that would be a very unusual circumstance. Okay. Um, that'll be fine. I have heard recently, much to my dismay, that there are some defense investigators who are showing up at work to serve with subpoenas. Um, that's really... It, it's legal, but it's really unacceptable. I hope that that doesn't happen to anybody. If it does, I would ask you just, I mean, don't make a big deal out of it. Just take the subpoena and kind of go along your way. I think it's kind of a power play for these defense investigators. Uh, I'll tell you why they do it is because legally, well, first of all, we will never, I'm not even going to know your home address. Even if I did, we would never pr provide that to the defense attorney. As an expert witness, you have the right for your only contact information to be at your work. So at your facility or that the number, work number of your facility. So that may be the only way the defense attorney has of contacting you. And legally, unless you are handed a subpoena, you don't have to show up to court. Don't ever do that <laughs> because uh, I'll tell you all the prosecutors, we're not going to hand deliver your subpoenas. We have working relationships with all of our experts, with all of our witnesses, and we just send the subpoena to the facility and there's a, a track to get that 
um, brought to you and for you to re reserve that date. So don't use that as an excuse to just start missing court willy-nilly. But the defense attorney knows that technically if they just mail you a subpoena and you don't show up, they're stuck. They can't ask for the sheriff to go and arrest you. So. Um, you know, show up no matter what. If it's a date, if you get a subpoena by either the state or the defense and you can't make it that day, and I don't mean like you're scheduled to work, but you already have tickets somewhere and you're scheduled for a medical thing, it's a special holiday, but I mean, if there's a if there's a good reason other than you don't really want to or you're working that day, let your prosecutor or the defense attorney know immediately. A lot of judges, judges are great about you know, setting over trials or rescheduling them if they are notified right away. And a lot of judges require when the state makes a motion to reset that trial that it says when the witness was notified, what the witness's conflict is, and when the witness told them about the conflict. So not a problem if you need it rescheduled, just get on that right away. Don't wait. All right, so now we're going to see some actual experts. I use that term a little bit loosely because, as you'll see, some of them, there's a range. Yeah, there, there's a range. So some of the best, uh, at least, trial where there's recorded testimony that I have seen that show the spectrum of experts and how effective or ineffective they can be are some of the experts in the Jody Arias trial. And I don't know if any of you followed this case. It was pretty, I guess, infamous. Um, it was on TV, I want to say, for like seven months because they ended up trying her twice. But she was a kind of a frightening young woman who met a man. Um, they were kind of loosely dating. She became a little bit fixated on him. And when he stopped wanting to spend time with her, she formulated a plan of some sort. And she drove, I think, over three state lines and goes to his house one day. And next thing we know, he winds up murdered in a pretty graphic way. So he was actually found in his shower with 27 stab wounds. His throat was slit and he'd been shot in the head. And they weren't able to tell initially whether he was shot in the head before or after he died. So pretty graphic, pretty personal, intimate murder. And obviously pretty high profile because these things don't generally happen um, uh, kind of in this neighborhood or to this type of person this this graphically. So they start doing their investigation and they open up the dryer and they find a camera. And in the camera, it's like a digital camera. I don't know whether they thought washing it would clear the digital memory, but in the camera are pictures of Jody Arias, the victim kind of engaged in some sexual activity, and then him actually in the shower covered in blood. So pretty good piece of evidence that she was probably involved in this. They initially contacted her and she denied being anywhere near the place. She said she was in a whole different state at the time. Then they confronted her with some of this photographic evidence and some of the other things they'd found. And then her story was that she was there, but these two masked intruders came in and you know, didn't do anything to her, but just massacred him in this horrible way. And she stuck with that for a good two years, well into her defense. And then her defense switched to, he was actually beating me and I have PTSD. Um, from several different reasons. And I have a lot of amnesia about what happened, so I did it, but I have an excuse because I have PTSD. So I basically shouldn't be found guilty for it. So it kind of set up the perfect opportunity for the battle of the experts. And we see this a lot, especially in higher profile or higher potential for prison sentence cases. And experts can come from all over the place. This case had a ton of experts on both sides. And I think it's interesting and hopefully it will give you guys a lot of confidence because nothing about the experts credentials um, equated to how well they did testifying. And I hope that you see that, that difference a little bit. The first clip is a Dr. Richard Samuels. Now he is very highly regarded, especially by himself, but he was a psychologist since 1986. Like this trial was in 2013. So he'd been around for a long time. He was the author of many articles. He described himself um, on his CV as a professional expert witness. He was an assistant professor at many different universities. He was the president of professional organizations, like for his state. Uh, he was really kind of well-renowned and he testified a lot over the years in a lot of different things. So he was hired by the defense to put forth this PTSD argument that he had you know, done some psychological examinations on her, diagnosed her with PTSD, which explained her memory loss, and she had this fight or flight reaction, which is what led to the killing, i.e. you should find her innocent. So let's take a look at just a snippet of what his testimony was. Nicole, I don't know where that is exactly. 
Okay, so we're going to switch over to YouTube here, and just as an FYI, the video runs just a little bit, um, like a little bit jerky, um, but the audio should be totally fine here. Oh, and my computer decided to close YouTube. Give us just a second here, pull it right back up. Sing us a song. <laughs> it always happens when you're in the middle of a presentation. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. So. It was absolutely. Oh, lovely. An ad. Well, we all get to experience this ad together in a second as I move this over. There's a ton of these on YouTube if anyone's interested in like seeing some additional clips. I mean, this trial went on for so long, and uh, a lot of these experts were kind of hotly contested. And quite frankly, this trial testimony ruined some careers, arguably. This ad is not an official endorsement by the Oregon Sexual Assault Task Force. Uh -huh. <laughs> At least it's not offensive. You're just mailing things. Exactly. Case mail. And verified. All right. Post-traumatic stress diagnostic scale test, that's the one that you scored yourself, right? Yes. You sat down and you looked, and the way that one works is that there are 49 questions, right? Yes. And then there's an answer sheet, right? Yes. And then there's a round circle that's filled in for the answer, right? Yes. And again, the validity of that test depends on the person answering that test accurately, right? Right. And so, for example, let's say that the person lied on that test. Let's assume that that's what happened, okay? With yes. regard to a PDS testing test. Wouldn't you agree that that would invalidate the results of the PDS test? Yes. And if it were used for the post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis, that would be a faulty diagnosis, right? Yes. Because it is used, if you will, as a way to confirm, right? Yes. Well, in this case, isn't it true, sir, that with regard to this PDS, the defendant lied on it? No, it's not true. There's also a part of this test that includes the questions, doesn't it? Yes. If I could have that. Where, where is that? I don't have it with me, apparently. Well, why don't you have it with you? I must have left it on my desk. <laughs> Sir, isn't it important to have a complete file so that you can answer whatever questions come up? And sir, if it was done by you and you were going to score it yourself, why did you use a pencil? Why did I use a pencil? Yes, instead of a pen. I prefer to use a pencil. And that's so that you can make some changes on it? If you want. So, are you implying that I cheated on that test? No, sir. I'm asking you some questions. What, however you want to take them, it's up to you. I'm just asking you some okay, questions. Ask me the question again. And the fact that at the time that you administered the PDS, she was still telling you that it had been the intruder who had killed Mr. Alexander. Yes. So, with regard to the first question, the person who was taking this, in this case the defendant, is asked to identify whether or not any of these events, serious events, have occurred in their life. Right? Their life Correct. Right. Because that, these kinds of events are the kinds of events that trigger these responses that we've been talking about. Loss of memory, right? Yes. That trigger the foggy memory, right? Yeah. And, for example, the first one says serious accident, fire, or explosion. For example, industrial, farm, car, plane, or boating accident. And the defendant answered yes to that one, right? Right. With regard to number two, natural disaster, for example, tornado, hurricane, flood, or major earthquake, the defendant also answered yes to that one, right? Yes. Number three, she's asked about non-sexual assault by a family member or someone you know. When it talks about someone you know, it isn't talking about you. It's talking about somebody the defendant knows, right? Yes. 
And it says, for example, being mugged, physically attacked, shot, stabbed, or held at gunpoint by someone you know, right? Yes. And she said, with regard to that, yes, right? Yes. And then she says, uh, number four, non-sexual assault by a stranger, right? Yes. For example, being mugged, physically attacked, shot, stabbed, or held at gunpoint. It's the same question as above, number three, only this one talks about a stranger, right? Correct. And she answered, yes, right? Yes. Number five, sexual assault by a family member or someone you know, for example, rape or attempted rape. She said no to that, didn't she? Yes. We heard testimony about issues from the defendant previously that she indicated something about a situation. Or I'm asking whether you're familiar with a situation where she claimed Mr. Alexander um, may have taken some clothes off, her clothes off and may have penetrated her. Are you familiar with that? Yes. And you characterized that one as a rape, didn't you? Yes. When we had our interview. Yes. But here, number five, she says no, it wasn't that, right? Yes. Then, this test goes on to part two, right? Yes. And it is asking the individual who's taking this test, in this case, the defendant, a question, right? Yes. And this is one of the guiding questions that determines or substantiates or confirms or helps you confirm the presence of PTSD, right? Yes. And in fact, the way you indicated where that your report where that first source on the post-traumatic stress disorder scale confirmed the presence of PTSD, right? Yes. It says here, if you mark yes for more than one traumatic event in part one, indicate which one bothers you the most. If you mark yes for only one traumatic event in part one, mark the same one on the answer sheet, right? Yes. And she's asked about the same 12 questions that we've just gone over, right? Yes. And the one that she indicated was the traumatic event in her life that triggers this post-traumatic stress disorder is what? Why don't you read number four? Not sexual assault, stranger. Not somebody that she knows, right? Correct. You said that you reviewed the photographs of the crime scene, right? Yes. And you talked about Mr. Alexander being in that shower, right? Yes. He's not a stranger, is he? No. He's somebody that she knew, right? Yes. And it's talking about that the thing that triggers it for her is PTSD is not sexual assault by a stranger, correct? Correct. But, but you used it. You, 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 knowing, you just said, knowing that this was a lie, you used it and then concluded that those scores on that PBS confirm the presence of PTSD, even though you just now told us that this is based on a lie. Perhaps I should have re-administered that test. Because this is one of the foundations for your finding of post-traumatic stress disorder on the defendant, right? Correct. The validity or the, this test uh, really is only as good as the person who is telling or filling it out, right? That's true. So if they're lying, then the test is not very good. That's correct. And in this case, we do have a circumstance where you know the defendant's lying and she lied on the test, right? Well, her answers didn't reflect what we ultimately discovered. Right, so she lied, right? Yes, or, or her answers may have been consistent with the story well, she was telling. Well, 533, question number 14, the answer, that's a lie. Yes. That, and she was given many choices, including right above there, non-sexual assault by someone she knew, right? Yes. So that is a lie, right? Uh, yes. It's, well, again. Hold it, sir. Okay. One of the things that the defendant told, or what the defendant told you was that um, this story about the strangers was fiction, correct? That's correct. And that, in fact, she had been the one to actually kill Mr. Alexander, correct? Yes. And yet you did not administer another PDS, correct? That was an oversight, and I should have done that. Absolutely positive. Okay, so that guy, 
obviously would not admit to anything. He obviously was pretty biased in that situation. I always like to get, when we're doing this in person, people's takes on how he did. But I think it was very... Good day. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was uh, very clear that whose side he was on, and he just wouldn't even admit to her telling him any lies. There were a lot of things I don't know if you could track, um, because it was such a short clip, but what was going on is he had diagnosed her initially with PTSD based on childhood trauma. Then he changed his opinion. Just one second. Uh, he actually changed his opinion uh, to she was suffering from PTSD because of this attack from these two masked strangers. And then when she admit that she lied about that, then he claimed that she was suffering PTSD because of domestic violence that she had suffered on the part of the victim. So he was all over the place. I don't know if you noticed, but um, he admitted to grading this test in pencil, which of course the one and only insinuation there is so that he could change the answers if he needed to. And here's what the jurors thought about him. First of all, they really didn't like him. They found him to be not very credible. They noted that he switched his theories midway through testimony. Again, this PTSD, the cause of the PTSD, shifting to be whatever was in the best interest of the defendant. There was a time when he must have heard he was missing crucial materials because he left them on his desk. And this is, this guy's flying from New Jersey to Arizona for this trial. He's been paid probably hundreds of thousands of dollars, yet he doesn't bring the materials he needs to court, which he, I'm sure, was a tad embarrassed when asked those questions. He, in fact, rescored the test results and they didn't yield his desired outcomes. Again, you can't trust this guy because he's so obviously biased for the defendant and therefore not helpful to either side. He used outdated materials, something they took note of. They thought his work was sloppy. He obviously took challenges personally. He was arguing back with the prosecutor in some of the questions. Sometimes he would admit yes, but then want to go on to explain. You know, at some point it was asked, you know, this was a lie, and he wouldn't even concede to that. And he was very, he acted like it was a personal attack on him. Jurors noted that he was overdue for a haircut. And their overall impression was that he just tried too little. For such a serious case, he just seemed like he liked her a whole lot and, and wasn't really doing his job. The overdue for a haircut, you're going to see a similar critique with the next expert that we'll show you. And you know, this always causes a bit of, of controversy because it's not fair that jurors care about what a witness looks like. I absolutely agree that it is not fair that they look at those things and judge your credibility based on that. Despite it not being fair, that's what they do. And so it is really important um, so the way a witness presents themselves, um, a way that they that they dress, the way they act in the hallway, all of those things the jurors really seize onto and for whatever reason use it to judge their credibility. Right or wrong, it's just kind of the way things are. So now we will look at a couple of clips from another defense witness. And this is Alice Laboyolette. She's a psychotherapist specializing in domestic violence since 1979. She is also described as a professional expert witness, lecturer, trainer, consultant, international speaker, and author. So this is somebody with a lot of experience, testified a lot of times. I will note real quick before we lose memory of the Richard Samuels testimony, it came out after the trial that he actually kind of had a crush on the defendant and had been sending her books while she was waiting trial and that it actually formed a pretty significant personal relationship with her. So again, I think that came across in his defensiveness of her, but let's check out Alice LaViolette's testimony. Particular case you told us that what, you spent what, 40 hours talking to the defendant? 44. 44 hours, so that's the clinical interview aspect of it, correct? I used that as one of the, that is the clinical interview that I did, right? Yes or no? You, that is a clinical aspect of your practice, correct? It is a clinical aspect of my practice. And in this case, 44 hours, that's the clinical aspect of this evaluation, right? I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by the clinical aspect. Well, a clinical interview, as you know what a clinical interview is, right? Of course I know what a clinical interview is. All right, is. then we seem to be having problems with that. With regard to a clinical interview, then, isn't that a situation where you sit across from an individual and you talk to them about the issue that is at hand? Isn't that true? You interview them. You ask questions. You do an assessment. So when you are interviewing, you're not talking then, right? Mr. Martinez, yes or no? My question is, are you talking yes or no? Mr. Martinez, are you angry at me? 
Ma'am, is that relevant to you? Is that important to you? Ladies and gentlemen, please refrain from laughing in the courtroom. Is that important to you whether or not the prosecutor is angry to you with regard to your evaluation? Does that make any difference to your evaluation whether or not the prosecutor is angry? Yes or no? It makes a difference to me the way I'm spoken to, and I would like you to speak to me the way I speak to you. Ma'am, is it true that just because the prosecutor is angry at you, is that going to make you change your uh, answer with regard to whether or not this is a battering situation? No, certainly not. The fact that the prosecutor may or may not, or you may perceive him as being angry, that really has nothing to do with your evaluation, does it? No, but it certainly is. Yes or no? Does it have anything to do with your evaluation and judge a yes or no answer? Judge, judge, she's trying to answer the question. Some of these questions cannot be answered by yes or no. Ms. Lavila, can you answer that question, yes or no? I'm not sure at this point what the question is because when someone is approaching in that way, it's very hard to listen. Restate your question. Just because somebody has a demeanor that you perceive to be angry, is that going to sway your opinion as to what you think in this case? No, it isn't. Is it going to change anything about your evaluation based on the way the questions are asked? No. If you want to, sp do you want to spar with me? Is that? Will that affect the way you view your testimony? The state. Read the Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
go back to the jury room for approximately five minutes. No more than five minutes. Please remember the admonition. the hurry up and wait of the courtroom. <laughs> Why not? A lot more people in there than it ever be in one of your trials. So take comfort from that. <laughs> with her um, she's kind of the same type of testimony as Richard Samuels but she her inability to give an answer uh, was just pretty shocking I think you can show by her clips her reluctance to testify as to exactly she knew exactly what the prosecutor wanted but her reluctance her reluctance to do it caused at least three recesses so what's the jury doing they are honing in on the fact that this woman will not answer a question and it makes jurors not like her and it makes them not trust her because if she truly didn't have a dog in the fight she would just answer the question so she really highlighted it she does a lot of things wrong you know unfortunately this clip you know i didn't add in the the words that, that happened. This woman's career has essentially been ruined because of her testimony. She's just lost all credibility because she was so biased in this case. Jurors, in regard to her testimony, found that she acted like an advocate, not like a expert that, that was educating them, that she wouldn't reply yes or no virtually ever. They felt she was dressed poorly for court. Again, not fair that they comment on those things, but they clearly do comment on those things. Uh, they didn't like the fact that she attacked the prosecutor, asking if he was angry at her. You know, she's kind of a prosecutor's dream because she got very defensive very quickly, and then he completely took advantage of that and ran with that. She played tug and war, you know, would go back and forth, wouldn't just concede and move on. It was quite obvious to the jurors that she liked and believed the defendant. She made inappropriate, impromptu comments. Again, you know, are you angry with me? Or if you were in my class, I'd tell you to take a time out. That she tried to be perfect instead of real. She always kind of wanted to be right. Again, part of this not conceding anything. And that she was trying too hard to be an advocate for Jody Arias. Uh, just as a aside, normally when we do this class in person, by about this time, people are noticing that Jody Arias is starting to look exactly like her defense attorney, which is just an interesting tidbit into her psychology. She liked to change her look a lot for the whatever suited her purpose. So now we're going to see a couple of clips from Dr. Janine DeMarte. 
And she should give you all a lot of confidence and a lot of hope that it doesn't take a lot of experience. Um, you might be called as an expert witness on your very first SANE examination that you ever did. And Dr. DeMarte was a psych or is a psychologist. She'd been practicing four years at the time of this trial, and she had only had less than a year as a clinical psychologist. So this is a not a seasoned expert witness. I believe this is her first trial where she ever testified as an expert witness. She was the only local. Uh, the other two defense experts were from out of state. So she was just a local psychologist. She still works um, out of Arizona. And she was just asked to do an evaluation, look at the evidence and talk to Ms. Arias. Then her testimony focused on the fact that Jody Arias did not have PTSD or amnesia, but instead she diagnosed her as having borderline personality disorder. So let's go ahead and check out her testimony. The profile tend to experience a lot of aggressiveness, hostility, defensiveness. But interestingly, these individuals do a relatively good job on a day-to-day -day basis of not displaying it to people. So this isn't someone who's walking around consistently hostile, throwing things, or it's visible to other people, but they're still experiencing those emotions inside. In times when they feel like they've been wronged in some sort of way, or when someone has um, done something to hurt them that they perceive as hurting them in any kind of way, the way that it's described in the literature is they have these violent outbursts that are described as seething, as, as very angry. And what they tend to do, what this profile suggests, is that these individuals tend to externalize blame. Because, so, for example, I acted out this way because that person deserved it. So they externalize it. They say, it's not my fault. I didn't act this way because I have these strong emotions inside. I act this way because someone did something to me. That's how they're able to conceptualize it and justify it in their mind. When I first started reviewing the records, there was indication in those records that there was a sense of immaturity that was present. Um, for example, in Miss Aries's booking profile, her the way that she took the picture, she kind of smiled as though it was a high school photo rather than a booking picture that you would typically see. This to me was uh, was strange. I found it to be strange and immature. There was also the things that happened surrounding that that suggested that there was, again, some immaturity there, such as her parents had indicated that she was described as being happy as hell when they came to visit her in jail. There was behaviors like this that were that were aberrant, that were strange, and it made, me, it made me wonder whether there was some sort of intellectual deficit there that could be contributing to this, which is why I gave the intelligence test. I diagnosed her on access to as borderline personality disorder. What does that mean? Generally, borderline personality disorder, you can think of it similar to what we see in teenagers often. This sense of immaturity and emotional, what's called emotional lability, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But generally, it's about instability. There's in, in, unstable interpersonal relationships, unstable emotions, and an unstable sense of identity, meaning who am I as a person? There's this constant fluctuation. There's a lot of manipulation that's involved with people who have... So that's uh, this doctor on direct examination, which of course is the easier of the two because you're just being asked to explain to the jury. But I like these clips because it shows, I mean, this is somebody who doesn't testify for a living, but she's obviously confident, comes across as incredibly, uh, I guess, unbiased and comfortable. She's looking off to the right a lot, which happens to be where the jury is sitting. And so she really listens to the question, seems to like turn to the jury and then just explain it. She's almost like a resource to the court. I also thought that her explanations were great. She uses personal examples. So she says, you know, here was my diagnosis. For example, I looked at X, Y, and Z. Um, but probably the most important reason why I showed the, this clip from direct examination is I have no doubt that she has practiced her explanation of these things. I mean, she has thought about exactly how she's going to explain borderline personality disorder, different examples she's going to give, what the, liter what the literature says. So she um, has practiced and comes across as really polished and incredibly credible. And next we're going to show you a clip of her on cross-examination. So now here's the point where, you know, she's being tested. She's asking, being asked leading questions. And notice how she responds uh, to these questions in comparison to the defense experts that you heard from. To May 26th of 2008, you're familiar with an, a, uh, 
instant messaging, right? Yes. Right? Okay. And part of your review of the instant messages, you also reviewed the text messages. Yes. And in reviewing those things, you, you would agree that there were times when Mr. Alexander was quite upset with Jody, right? Yes. And he showed his anger with Jody in his text messages, didn't he? Yes. And he called her all kinds of names. He called her names, yes. And do you know what character assassination is? Yes. And isn't that when names become actually so severe that it cuts down the person's own character, their own being? I think that would be one definition, yes. Okay. And you'd agree that a lot of these names that he was calling her was actually character assassination, wasn't it? They were harsh names, yes. And you wouldn't consider that to be okay? No, that's not okay. And in fact, that was abusive, wasn't it? Abuse implies that it's a pattern of behavior. I would say that that behavior was certainly inappropriate and not healthy communication style. Okay, but you don't consider it abusive? I would say, again, the word abuse implies a pattern of behavior. Well, let's not, we can talk about patterns in a second, okay. but the word, I'm talking about the word abuse. So you mean that unless it's repeated, this one particular instant wouldn't be considered abusive to you? If we define abuse as a misuse of something? No, Dr. Just Marte, a misuse? Yes. hold on a second. What I'm asking you is this one particular instant, on May 26, let's say, when Mr. Alexander, as you've agreed, was calling her names consistent yes. with character assassination. You, would, you wouldn't agree that that's abusive? I'm trying to explain to you what I mean. Well, I'm asking, you're telling me that abuse is a pattern, so if it's, if it's just one instant, then is that not abuse? I'd like to clarify, can I speak? And it's a yes or no question. I don't believe I can answer in yes or no. All right, so then, so then that's a no. No, I just said I can't answer you in yes or no. All right, so then let's talk about patterns. You want to talk about patterns, and, and when we talk about abuse, you want to look for more than one instance of it, right? For you to characterize it as abuse? I, again, would like to clarify that. Do you want to see a pattern when you're looking at abuse? I'd like to clarify that. Clarify the fact that what whether or not you want to look at a pattern? What I've been trying to clarify. I, I, I'm moving on, so I'm just asking the question, do you want to see a pattern when you're looking for abuse? It depends on how the word abuse is used. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. If it's implied that there's a pattern, no. If you're talking about the word abuse as being a misuse of something in one instance, then you can use the word abuse in a single incident, yes. Okay. Is that, did you clarify enough? I did, thank you. All right, you're welcome. I'd like to clarify. Isn't that what you just said? I'd like to clarify. Did you not say that? I'm getting a little confused by the verbiage that you're, the way you're phrasing your questions. Okay. All right. So the fact that she was not elevated in things like aggression and dominance and hostility, that was not important to you. Research doesn't support low elevation. I'm asking you a question, Dr. DeMarte. I just want you to answer the question. Okay, can you ask that again, please? Yes. The fact that she was low in hostility, low in aggression, and low in dominance, that was not important to you. Is that what you're saying? You didn't interpret it, right? I did not interpret it. Okay. Thank you. Nothing further. Sounded absolutely positive. So in that case, the defense attorney was asking questions just like the prosecutor was when he was questioning the defense experts. The difference is the defense expert was arguing back with the prosecutor, so she came off looking bad. In this case, in the uh, cross-examination of Dr. DeMarte, defense counsel was essentially arguing with herself. So she was just coming up against a brick wall with every question because, you know, you could tell Dr. DeMarte was getting a little bit frustrated, but she stayed very much cool, calm, and collected and refused to kind of argue back. And it made her so much more credible and unfortunately for the defense attorney made her come off pretty bad and like she was kind of trying to avoid the truth from coming out. So here's what jurors thought of Dr. DeMarte that she admitted without apology she was not an expert in DV. So again, she stayed in her wheelhouse. She wasn't overreaching. She answered short and sweet. That's correct. I'm aware of that. Yes. She conceded all of those things um, about the, you know, the, whatever the text message was, whether it was abusive or not, that like, yes, that's absolutely not okay. That's inappropriate communication. That's correct. She rejected having words put in her mouth, but she did so in a way that I would suggest that you approach it, which is, you know, can I clarify? Can I just clarify? And so it, Again, looks like the defense attorney is trying to prevent her from accurately answering the question. But she conceded flatly. She didn't 
have a caveat to her yes or no's. She didn't try to offer explanations when they weren't necessary. She appropriately stood her ground and she didn't strive for perfection. She didn't pretend to know it all, but she was realistic and the jurors thought that she came off as much more real than the defense attorney experts. So I'll show you one more quick sample and this is just going to be a kind of collage of Dr. DeMarte's facial reactions to different objections. Behavior, there was indication that she had gone into his Facebook account numerous There was an indication that some emails were deleted. Who deleted these emails? It was Miss Arias was accused of doing that. It was in times where he felt lied to, betrayed, or also an example of that immaturity that I talked about before, making these uh, immature statements, these immature statements that are often seen in people with borderline personality disorder. What would be important to me to know is how she experienced the event. The world. So I think that those are kind of important to see. One, just to see what happens when somebody objects. I can tell you this defense attorney was not doing her client any favors here because she was just continually objecting and that's just not good form. But what Dr. DeMarte did correctly is her response. So you can see she was obviously, she was shocked a couple times, but the key was is that she immediately stopped talking and she looked to the judge for what to do next. And that's exactly what to do. So when someone's objecting to your testimony, if they do, it's not because you said or did anything wrong. It's just a, it's a lawyer tactic and it's for the judge to sort out. So the key is you just stop testifying. You look, you wait for the judge to either say, go ahead and answer or you can't answer that. I think the key to how, again, cool, calm and collected she was, was that her, she was kind of shocked at times, but she didn't come off as defensive or irritated. It was more just surprised at like, really? She doesn't want that to come out. So did amazingly well, especially for a relatively new to her field and kind of first time expert, but really good example of, of being the type of expert that, that I would want. So our last slide is just a couple of takeaways. I appreciate all your time today. I know it's a long two hours kind of sitting in one place, but the, what I would like you to leave with is that expert testimony is dependent on both, again, competence and performance. You have the competence, so I've given you hopefully a few tricks of the trade to improve performance. Make sure your prosecutor is prepared and prepares you. Again, sometimes if you're not getting that call back and it's getting close to trial and that's making you anxious, please reach out to your prosecutor and make sure that you know what they expect of you and what to expect from the defense. And mainly, I think always keep in mind to help you come across as the unbiased expert educating witness that you are, is that, that okay, this case just isn't about you. It never will be. Your testimony is just a piece of the puzzle. Um, it helps explain a lot of things. It helps maybe corroborate some things. And it, it helps uh, bolster sometimes the victim's testimony. Sometimes it just helps educate the jury on an issue that's important in the trial. So you can't make or, beg or break this case. You're just there to facilitate education and maybe some factual information that no one else can testify about. So we appreciate you all so much being willing to do this work. It's made a huge difference in the state and I think people willing to take these things to trial. I know it's a big comfort to victims that they have highly trained people like you folks who are and helping work with them immediately after these horrible things happen. And please always feel free to reach out to either Nicole or myself with any of these questions. There are no dumb questions. If you get a subpoena, if you get uh, nervous about court, if you want to know what a certain hearing is about, I'm always available to answer questions and help navigate that system, regardless of whether I know about the case or it's my case or not. I can help put you in contact with the prosecutors and kind of just be, a, be your liaison. So thank you all for your time. Um, and Nicole? We'll leave it to you. Yeah, thank you all for attending. Really appreciate it. Um, if you have any questions, um, I'm checking our question box here, and there's a note, wow, that was hard to watch in regards to some of the testimony, which, yeah, can understand. Um, and then I don't think we have anything in the chat. Okay, so if you do have any questions come up, feel free to go ahead and send me an email. Um, 
let's see. Oh, great webinar. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Um, feel free to send me an email. Um, there's the, the first slide of this had uh, the contact information for the task force. And we will be posting this recording online um, so that you do have access to all this stuff. Um, all of you who attended today will be getting two CEUs and we will email you those certificates within the next week. Um, they'll come from Judy Hayes. So uh, just be patient, keep an eye out for those. Um, if you haven't received anything in a week, send me an email. Um, but otherwise, I've collected all of your information. And again, thank you very much for attending today and hope you all have a great rest of your week. Thank you.